We're going to begin with uh, Professor Rasmussen making a little comment about the brochures. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chuck. I ask for a moment of, of personal privilege um, to follow up just a bit on what Mary Gabler mentioned in her introduction, a project at Ghost Ranch, which really continues the themes of this uh, conference. Uh, there's a decade-long project at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. Newsweek says it's one of the 20 places you need to visit before you die. Um, <clears throat> if you know George O'Keefe's paintings, you know that they are of Ghost Ranch or landscape uh, paintings of the Southwest. Uh, the ranch has committed itself to a decade-long project called Earth Honoring Faith, the Song of Songs, and we take a different topic each year to focus on both for educational programming and for ranch practices. So two years ago we did Energy and How We Live. This uh, past summer we did Ritual and Loving the Earth Fiercely. Next summer we're going to do Water and a Baptismal Life, and 2011 we're going to do Envisioning Paradise, Beauty and Biological Restoration. So it's always a back and forth between what communities of faith can bring uh, from their traditions and resources to the great issues facing us, or starting on the other end, starting with issues of water, energy, food, and then asking what happens in a conversation with faith communities. So next summer I've got three water experts in water law, water advocacy, and um, uh, hands-on working with local communities on their water issues in conversation with uh, artists, theologians, and liturgists. So I just invite you to that. Um, as you leave this afternoon, there will be ushers who will happily, I hope happily, um, smile as you go by and uh, hand you a flyer about that. Thank you very much, Chuck. Okay, thank you. Would any of our panelists like to begin our discussion? I'll go. Nancy. <clears throat> um, you finally got around to it at the very end that um, to have respect for water and want people to have water, you also have to have respect for the human community. And uh, to, um, you know, acknowledge the worth and dignity of every human being. Um, and most of your presentation and most of your um, ranch work and everything you keep talking about faith-based communities, is there hope for the heathens to have <laughs> any chance to um, have a part in uh, taking care of our earth? Are you speaking for yourself here? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, Say yes. Well, Not yes. <laughs> yeah, you're hesitating too long. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hesitate about the yes. Um, um, actually, people as moral, moral people can be and are moral creatures, whether or not they practice religious faith. Thank you. So, I agree uh, <clears throat> so I, I do think the, the questions are profoundly moral, and for many people, their um, moral perspective is, is based in a, in a religious tradition. I mean, there is a connection for a lot of folks, but it isn't a necessary uh, connection. So the same kind, all kinds of folks have had, res have had respect for Mother Earth, mm -hmm. whether or not they would articulate that. Uh, in religious or heathen terms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good save. Um, Dr. Glick? Well, I, uh, first of all, thank you for a beautiful talk. The, the language mm -hmm. was wonderful. It was, it was great yeah. to listen to. Uh, just a quick clarification on addition versus multiplication. Um, I'm hoping that you weren't implying that individual action wasn't important. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, both from a moral perspective, both from a personal belief perspective, and frankly, from an effectiveness perspective. I actually think personal belief and personal action drives uh, change. And, and I think that's what you were saying, but I just want to give you a chance to... Yeah, 
Thanks, thanks. Yeah, and the reason I said that both were truths and needed to be held together, namely, the kind of the voluntary, how do we change our hearts and minds, has to be held together with the, the fact that, that um, the behavioral changes often precede the attitudinal ones. But there's a very intimate relationship between them. And if you don't have people making those voluntary individual changes, they probably won't be ready for the bigger changes that have to come <laughs> through more coercive terms when the time comes. I mean, you, you, you have to have a kind of critical mass that's ready for uh, the systemic and the institutional change. And you won't get that critical mass if you don't have people, um, or it won't, it won't uh, sustain itself if you don't have people who don't, in the process, make their, make their own changes. Those shorter sh showers or uh, plumbing for gray water or uh, rain harvesting, etc. If you've got all kinds of people doing that, then when it comes to the zoning regulations in the city that require that, you'll 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 have a constituency for it. So I'm I'm all in favor of the integration of these two. And I said just in passing that I thought Derek Jensen's forget about um, showers um, was overstating the point. From a religious point of view and from the point of view of Christian faith, the role of the prophetic gesture is an important one. I mean, so Jeremiah says, seek the welfare of the city in which you find yourself. It happens to be in exile, but seek the welfare of Babylon. Buy a patch of real estate there and do something with it. That, that, uh, that prophetic gesture, which belongs to this world of... Um, a voluntary change in changing hearts, minds, growing us up uh, one uh, song at a time is, is absolutely critical for the change. The point there was that simply to rely upon a strategy of voluntary action is not sufficient. It's necessary, it's not sufficient. It won't get there. You've got to get the changed laws and institutions. Yeah. David. So, Larry, despite the disparaging remarks about engineers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, wish I could say some of my best friends are engineers, but I can't, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bother, they're kind of boring. <laughs> um, but despite the remarks, um, a lot of what you said resonated with me and, and I think made a lot of sense and, and was easy to understand and, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. But when I think about discussions I've had with colleagues in other countries and from other cultures, I'd have a hard time translating your ethic. And so huh. I'm curious about your experiences discussing your uh, water ethic with people from other cultures and what challenges you think there are in translating this idea across cultures. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I certainly am talking to a group that includes most of us here who do share a considerable uh, culture together. It, I mean, it's all contextual, so it depends on what kind of cultures you're talking about. In this Ghost Ranch project, one of the commitments in the decade-long um, effort is always to involve uh, other communities in northern New Mexico. Now that includes a thousand years of Pueblo Indian uh, people who live sustainably on that land and, and, and 400 years of Hispanic farmers. And then you've got us Anglos there, you know. Um, the, the Pueblo Indian, this is not another country, the same country, although they say we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, have got no problem understanding the ethic I'm, I'm telling about. They've got much to teach me about how, how, you, how you treat water and how you understand water. And I was, without saying it, I was trying to incorporate some of that wisdom uh, into this. So it depends, it depends on what cultures, because their relationship to water will be, where, will be the starting point, and that will often be one in which 
uh, water is perceived as a being. A river is a being, or a mountain is a being. Um, so I, I'm just saying you've got to look at context. It's all about context. Thank you. Dr. Graff? Uh, more than once today, we've heard the term water people. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and this is not an engineer joke. Um, there aren't any. <laughs> I, I need to digress just slightly in order to ask my question. There once was a popular movie called Poldergeist, which in, a, in which a little girl sees emanating from her television images of TV people. And these TV people were ghostly and slightly malevolent. Uh, and her most famous line in the movie was, they're here. <laughs> and, and, and as you, were, you and other speakers have used the term water people, I have kind of the same spooky feeling. <laughs> uh, who are the water people, and how can citizens interact with them? <laughs> yeah. Well done. Um, I, think, I think Peter Gleck, who uses used that term all the time in his talk, water people, probably had a... Really? Diff oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. Had a different, uh, had a different back and meaning in, in mind than, than I did. I think you were talking about the, you people who are constantly looking at water conditions and water policy and working in the world of uh, science of, of, of water. Uh, whereas my, my point was um, a different one. When I s talked about water people, I was just trying to say where we are as human beings in an evolutionary in an evolutionary context where we came from and, and how important water is because we forget that. Now we're still pretty scary, but you know, <laughs> that's looking looking at each other. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna respond to that if that's what you're waiting for. <laughs> I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Biswas. Yes. Uh, I enjoyed your talk because this is a type of talk I normally do not hear. But in one or two areas I beg to differ from you. And I take up David's question in that regard. You said very approvingly of a gentleman called Grunfeld, of course I don't know him very well, I, I don't know, know of him. Command and control is wrong. Oh. You did not? The Pardon? Command and control? Yes, yes. that's what he calls the, what he calls the yes. conventional no, I, water. Yes, convention. Yeah. If you speak in an American context, I have no problem with you. I'm not an expert in the U.S. You know much more in the U.S. than I do, but I don't have any problem. But the context in the other parts of the world are totally different. Yeah. Let me give you one example, like Asia. It's a vast continent where more than half the people of the world live. If I look at Asia, and if I look at the annual rainfall, which is the main source of water in Asia, except for some Himalayan rivers where the snowfall comes, if I look at the annual rainfall, annual rainfall in most of the Asian countries occurs in 80 to 100 hours, 80 to 100 hours, not consecutive. I submit to you mm -hmm. and your colleague Grunfeld that you cannot provide water for the millions and billions of people without command and control. When tremendous amount of rain falls in 80 to 100 hours, the chances of storing it, providing it for the rest of the year is impossible with the command and control. So in the different contextual, I, have, I beg to differ from you, there's no possibility that without command and control you'll make progress, or in fact, what you're suggesting is a recipe for disaster for most of the Indians and the Chinese and the others, if you follow that philosophy. Second, much of the rivers in these countries are ephemeral. That means for six to eight months of the year, there is no water. There is no water in the rivers. They are dry. So 
in, because of some of this command and control, few of these rivers have now been made permanent because of the command and control. One example is the Narmada River, which has now made one of the biggest rivers of Gujarat, Sabarmati, instead of flowing three to four months a year, it now flows 12 months a year. Huh. So whatever you are saying, I have no problem in an American context, yeah. but I would have mm. considerable difficulty to accept your philosophy in an international context. Yeah. So it has to be case-specific, context-specific. Yes. That is my comment. Yes, thank you very much. And what David Grunfeld is uh, talking about in con contrasting these two uh, paradigms of water management isn't about whether there should be engineering or not engineering, whether there should be interventions on the part of human beings in the, in the what we might otherwise call the natural flows of water. It's whether you are account, whether it's uh, human beings looking at the context only in terms of the use of water for human beings, and then uh, that becomes the total relationship of human beings to water, or whether it's water for human beings and for the maintenance of the ecosystems uh, of those of that. So it's, 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 it's too overdrawn to say command and control if you, uh, if you mean, okay, then that's a kind of hands-off uh, as a contrast with it. It's not hands-off. It's a different kind of inner engineering. And that might be, I mean, in Asia, as you well know and better than us, you're still big, building a lot of big dams. Uh, but you might consider what uh, Dr. Click talked about earlier, is that uh, the best way to preserve both, meet both the needs of human beings and provide a river that runs 12 months a year instead of three months a year, and at the same time uh, have what the South Africans call the ecological reserve needs met. I would also add uh, the Chinese have certainly adopted a command and control approach in this sense a highly engineering centralized approach. And one could argue that they've neither acknowledged or addressed the ecological component of the hydrologic cycle that they live in, nor have they solved their human water problems. Huh. And so there are limits <clears throat> to the command and control approach everywhere. And I think understanding those limits and figuring out how to meet human needs for water and ecological needs for water is really what, what uh, mm. I, I think Larry was trying to, mm. to say. But the, the comment I was making was, I, I think in some cultures, and, and perhaps China might be an example, um, the assumption that you make that you can explain the ecological need for water and people will see it the same way and decide that it trumps the human need uh, may take work because I don't think that some of these ideas translate across cultures as easily as we'd like to think they do. And, and, and I think that there's, there's different ways culturally of discussing uh, the ecological need and making it compelling because um, my experience is sometimes that's lost in translation and a very difficult thing to express. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, frankly, I don't believe that sort of one ethic fits all either. I mean, you, you, you must begin uh, where people are and inside their world and work with them and, and establish trust and communication there. It isn't that I, I've got an ethic that now is the right one for you. I've got a question from the audience. Is there a tension or conflict between meeting the needs of future generations versus the poor and the natural world with us now? And if so, how do we approach this? Um, yes, uh, there, there is a problem, and that's you know, what I was trying to illustrate by showing the combination of escalating human population and quadrupling. Uh, economic activity, uh, it, it, uh, it puts a huge strain on 
um, efforts to abide by those three principles uh, for the rights of future generations that I borrowed from Edith uh, Weiss. Um, and <clears throat> I, I appreciated what has come up in this conference so far in showing that there are, for example, massive inefficiencies to be wrung out of the present way in which we do it. But you can often have, as we do in Santa Fe, and as Peter Glick talked about in the U.S. generally, you can, you can have a de de decreasing amount of water used by each individual, and yet have a sum total of water uh, exceed what you had before because of the increased population and the increased economic uh, activity. So the trend lines are such that it's a real conflict between the present and the needs of, of future generations. And I think we've heard enough things to know, and there are many more yet that rely on a genuine resource, the best one of all, human ingenuity, uh, to, to find the way both for, um, uh, the, I think the population will, will, will level off for a lot of uh, reasons. And I think uh, we'll have much more efficient use of, of, of water, including recycled uh, water, and that'll, that'll happen too. But right now, we've got a huge conflict, and it, it, uh, it is incumbent upon us all to find what ways we can to, to use less and to preserve the kind of um, uh, ecosystems that will 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 be there for a while. That's challenged by by climate change. That's the that's the wild card here. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a question that's sort of from the internet and also from an audience member. In your presentation, are you attributing divine elements to water, or simply noting its role in creation and life? Yeah. <coughs> Oops. Excuse me. <laughs> That wasn't part of the comment. Um, I, and I'm going to speak personally now. Everybody calls me a theologian. I'm an ethicist. I finally figured out that that's, they want, it's all right to get an invitation to be a theologian in residence, but nobody wants an ethicist in residence. Um, but I'm going to speak as a theological ethicist. Um, <laughs> The, there's a very important distinction between sacred and divine. Uh, sacred is a manner of, of, of understanding that it has in, intrinsic value and inherent uh, worth, and that it participates in, in, uh, in that which uh, includes the transcendent. And so I tried to get at that by a refrain of, it's a little bit mystical. There's a mystical dimension there as well. Uh, I don't consider it divine in the sense that I don't make it uh, a synonym for God. I still draw a distinction between the creator and the created. But the, the, that which is the handiwork of the creator is sacred. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from the internet, actually it's a, it came up a couple times in different ways. Uh, which would you say is the root of the water crisis? Overpopulation or personal usage of water? Yes. Well, those two belong together. You've got a huge population using more water, even if some don't have enough, thus the chair there for the poor. Um, those, those, those two belong together. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I think we'll do one more question here. We have time for one more, maybe. Um, many of our neighbors take the words of Genesis to mean that they have the right to do whatever they want with the world. What would you say to them? I would say, don't get me started. <laughs> um, there are two Genesis stories. Um, the, what people pick up on is in one, be fruitful and multiply. They forget that the first time God commanded that, it was the command to the birds and the fish. 
Check it out. Genesis 1:21. Uh, when human beings are created, the command is to till and, <clears throat> and cultivate. Um, the Hebrew, Adam, Adam, is a Hebrew pun on the Hebrew Adama, which means topsoil. Adam is the earth creature. It's a groundling. It's human from humus. Luther says in his Genesis commentator, the cultivator, the one tilling, came from a clod. We're all clods. <laughs> whose who's, who's, uh, calling is to till and keep, to preserve, Adama. When Cain kills Abel, it's not Adam and Eve who cry out. I'm sure they did cry out. It's Adama. It's the ground that cries out. And Cain says, when he's expelled from, to be expelled from Eden, it's too great a burden for me to be expelled from the land. So this relationship in Hebrew is as it is in many primordial uh, human visions, one of us as earth creatures who emerge from the earth, live a while, return. Uh, to the earth, and our calling is to till and preserve the earth. Okay, thank you.